U.S. History, an OpenStax textbook. Read along with the full text at www.openstax.org. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 31 From Cold War to Culture Wars, 1980-2000 to 2000. Introduction Act Up might be called the unofficial slogan of the 1980s. Numerous groups were concerned by what they considered disturbing social, cultural, and political trends in the United States and lobbied for their vision of what the nation should be. Conservative politicians cut taxes for the wealthy and shrank programs for the poor, while conservative Christians blamed the legalization of abortion and the increased visibility of gays and lesbians for weakening the American family. When the U.S. Centers for Disease Control first recognized the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, in 1981, the religious right regarded it as a plague sent by God to punish gay men for their unnatural behavior. Politicians, many of whom relied on religious conservatives for their votes, largely ignored the AIDS epidemic. In response, organizations such as ACTUP were formed to draw attention to their cause. Toward the end of the decade in 1989, protesters from both East and West Berlin began acting up and tearing down large chunks of the Berlin Wall, essentially dismantling the Iron Curtain. This symbolic act was the culmination of earlier demonstrations that had swept across Eastern Europe, resulting in the collapse of communist governments in both Central and Eastern Europe, and marking the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Thirty-one point one. The Reagan Revolution. Learning Objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain Ronald Reagan's attitude towards government, discuss the Reagan administration's economic policies and their effects on the nation. Ronald Reagan entered the White House in 1981 with strongly conservative values, but experience in moderate politics. He appealed to moderates and conservatives anxious about social change and the seeming loss of American power and influence on the world stage. Leading the so-called Reagan Revolution, he appealed to voters with the promise that the principles of conservatism could halt and revert the social and economic changes of the last generation. Reagan won the White House by citing big government and attempts at social reform as the problem, not the solution. He was able to capture the political capital of an unsettled national mood and, in the process, helped set an agenda and policies that would affect his successors and the political landscape of the nation. Reagan's Early Career Although many of his movie roles and the persona he created for himself seemed to represent traditional values, Reagan's rise to the presidency was an unusual transition from pop cultural significance to political success. Born and raised in the Midwest, he moved to California in 1937 to become a Hollywood actor. He also became a reserve officer in the U.S. Army that same year. But when the country entered World War II, he was excluded from active duty overseas because of poor eyesight and spent the war in the Army's first motion picture unit. After the war, he resumed his film career, rose to leadership in the Screen Actors Guild, a Hollywood union, and became a spokesman for General Electric and the host of a television series that the company sponsored. As a young man, he identified politically as a liberal Democrat, but his distaste for communism, along with the influence of the social conservative values of his second wife, actress Nancy Davis, edged him closer to conservative republicanism. By 1962, he had formally switched political parties, and in 1964, he actively campaigned for the Republican presidential nominee, Barry Goldwater. Reagan launched his own political career in 1966 when he successfully ran for governor of California. His opponent was the incumbent Pat Brown, a liberal Democrat 
who had already served two terms. Reagan, quite undeservedly, blamed Brown for race riots in California and student protests at the University of California at Berkeley. He criticized the Democratic incumbents' increases in taxes and state government and denounced big government and the inequities of taxation in favor of free enterprise. As governor, however, he quickly learned that federal and state laws prohibited the elimination of certain programs and that many programs benefited his constituents. He ended up approving the largest budget in the state's history and approved tax increases on a number of occasions. The contrast between Reagan's rhetoric and practice made up his political skill. Capturing the public mood and catering to it, but compromising when necessary. Republicans back in the White House After two unsuccessful Republican primary bids in 1968 and 1976, Reagan won the presidency in 1980. His victory was the result of a combination of dissatisfaction with the presidential leadership of Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter in the 1970s and the growth of the New Right. This group of conservative Americans included many very wealthy financial supporters and emerged in the wake of the social reforms and cultural changes of the 1960s and 1970s. Many were evangelical Christians, like those who joined Jerry Falwell's moral majority and opposed the legalization of abortion, the feminist movement, and sex education in public schools. Reagan also attracted people, often dubbed neoconservatives, who would not previously have voted for the same candidate as conservative Protestants did. Many were middle and working class people who resented the growth of federal and state governments, especially benefit programs, and the subsequent increase in taxes during the late 1960s and 1970s. They favored the tax revolts that swept the nation in the late 1970s under the leadership of predominantly older white middle-class Americans, which had succeeded in imposing radical reductions in local property and state income taxes. Voter turnout reflected this new conservative swing, which not only swept Reagan into the White House, but created a Republican majority in the Senate. Only 52% of eligible voters went to the polls in 1980, the lowest turnout for a presidential election since 1948. Those who did cast a ballot were older, whiter, and wealthier than those who did not vote. Strong support among white voters, those over 45 years of age, and those with incomes over $50,000 proved crucial for Reagan's victory. Reaganomics Reagan's primary goal upon taking office was to stimulate the sagging economy while simultaneously cutting both government programs and taxes. His economic policies, called Reaganomics by the press, were based on a theory called supply-side economics, about which many economists were skeptical. Influenced by economist Arthur Laffer of the University of Southern California, Reagan cut income taxes for those at the top of the economic ladder which was supposed to motivate the rich to invest in businesses, factories, and the stock market in anticipation of high returns. According to Laffer's argument, this would eventually translate into more jobs further down the socioeconomic ladder. Economic growth would also increase the total tax revenue, even at a lower tax rate. In other words, proponents of trickle-down economics promised to cut taxes and balance the budget at the same time. Reaganomics also included the deregulation of industry and higher interest rates to control inflation. But these initiatives preceded Reagan and were conceived in the Carter administration. Many politicians, including Republicans, were wary of Reagan's economic program. Even his eventual vice president, George H.W. Bush, had referred to it as voodoo economics when competing with him for the Republican presidential nomination. When Reagan proposed a 30% cut in taxes to be phased in over his first term in office, Congress balked. Opponents argued that the tax cuts would benefit the rich and not the poor, who needed help the most. In response, Reagan presented his plan directly to the people. Reagan was an articulate spokesman for his political perspectives 
and was able to garner support for his policies. Often called the Great Communicator, he was noted for his ability, honed through years as an actor and spokesperson, to convey a mixture of folksy wisdom, empathy, and concern while taking humorous digs at his opponents. Indeed, listening to Reagan speak often felt like hearing a favorite uncle recall stories about the good old days before big government, expensive social programs, and greedy politicians destroyed the country. Americans found this rhetorical style extremely compelling. Public support for the plan, combined with a surge in the president's popularity after he survived an assassination attempt in March 1981, swayed Congress, including many Democrats. On July 29, 1981, Congress passed the Economic Recovery Tax Act, which phased in a 25% overall reduction in taxes over a period of three years. Reagan was successful at cutting taxes, but he failed to reduce government spending. Although he had long warned about the dangers of big government, he created a new cabinet-level agency, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the number of federal employees increased during his time in office. He allocated a smaller share of the federal budget to anti-poverty programs like Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, food stamps, rent subsidies, job training programs, and Medicaid, but Social Security and Medicare entitlements, from which his supporters benefited, were left largely untouched, except for an increase in payroll taxes to pay for them. Indeed, in 1983, Reagan agreed to a compromise with the Democrats in Congress on a $165 billion injection of funds to save Social Security, which included this payroll tax increase. But Reagan seemed less flexible when it came to deregulating industry and weakening the power of labor unions. Banks and savings and loan associations were deregulated. Pollution control was enforced less strictly by the Environmental Protection Agency, and restrictions on logging and drilling for oil on public lands were relaxed. Believing the free market was self-regulating, the Reagan administration had little use for labor unions and, in 1981, the president fired 12,000 federal air traffic controllers who had gone on strike to secure better working conditions, which would also have improved the public safety. His action effectively destroyed the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO, and ushered in a new era of labor relations in which, following his example, employers simply replaced striking workers. The weakening of unions contributed to the leveling off of real wages for the average American family during the 1980s. Reagan's economic policymakers succeeded in breaking the cycle of stagflation that had been plaguing the nation, but at significant cost. In its effort to curb high inflation with dramatically increased interest rates, the Federal Reserve also triggered a deep recession. Inflation did drop, but borrowing became expensive and consumers spent less. In Reagan's first years in office, bankruptcies increased and unemployment reached about 10%, its highest level since the Great Depression. Homelessness became a significant problem in cities, a fact the president made light of by suggesting that the press exaggerated the problem and that many homeless people chose to live on the streets. Economic growth resumed in 1983, and gross domestic product grew at an average of 4.5% during the rest of his presidency. By the end of Reagan's second term in office, unemployment had dropped to about 5.3%, but the nation was nearly $3 trillion in debt. An increase in defense spending, coupled with $3.6 billion in tax relief for the 162,000 American families with incomes of $200,000 or more, made a balanced budget, one of the president's campaign promises in 1980 impossible to achieve. The Reagan years were a complicated era of social, economic, and political change, with many trends operating simultaneously and sometimes at cross-purposes. While many suffered, others prospered. The 1970s had been the era of the hippie, 
and Newsweek magazine declared 1984 to be the year of the yuppie. Yuppies, whose name derived from young urban professionals, were akin to hippies in being young people whose interests, values, and lifestyle influenced American culture, economy, and politics, just as the hippies' credo had done in the late 1960s and 1970s. Unlike hippies, however, yuppies were viewed as being materialistic and obsessed with image, comfort, and economic prosperity. Although liberal on some social issues, economically, they were conservative. Ironically, some yuppies were former hippies or yippies, like Jerry Rubin, who gave up his crusade against the establishment to become a businessman. Thirty-one point two, political and cultural fusions. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to discuss the culture wars and political conflicts of the Reagan era. Describe the religious rights response to the issues of the Reagan era. Ronald Reagan's victory in 1980 suggested to conservatives that the days of liberalism were over, and the liberal establishment might be dismantled. Many looked forward to the discontinuation of policies like affirmative action. Conservative Christians sought to outlaw abortion and stop the movement for gay and lesbian rights. Republicans and some moderate Democrats demanded a return to traditional family values, a rhetorical ploy to suggest that male authority over women and children constituted a natural order that women's rights and the new left had subverted since the 1960s. As the conservative message regarding the evils of government permeated society, distrust of the federal government grew, inspiring some to form organizations and communities that sought complete freedom from government control. Creating Conservative Policy Ronald Reagan's popularity and effectiveness as a leader drew from his reputation as a man who fought for what he believed in. He was a very articulate spokesperson for a variety of political ideas based on conservative principles and perspectives. Much of the intellectual meat of the Reagan revolution came from conservative think tanks, policy or advocacy groups that specifically sought to shape American political and social dialogues. The Heritage Foundation, one such group, soon became the intellectual arm of the conservative movement. Launched in 1973 with a $250,000 contribution from Joseph Coors of Coors Brewing Company and support from a variety of corporations and conservative foundations, the Heritage Foundation sought to counteract what conservatives believed to be Richard Nixon's acceptance of a liberal consensus on too many issues. In producing its policy position papers and political recommendations to conservative candidates and politicians, it helped contribute to a sanitization of U.S. history and a nostalgic glorification of what it deemed to be traditional values, seemingly threatened by the expansion of political and personal freedoms. The foundation had lent considerable support and encouragement to the conservative dialogues that helped carry Ronald Reagan into office in 1980. Just a year later, it produced a document entitled Mandate for Leadership that cataloged some 2,000 specific recommendations on how to shrink the size and reach of the federal government and implement a more consistent conservative agenda. The newly elected Reagan administration looked favorably on the recommendations and recruited several of the paper's authors to serve in the White House. Conservative Christians and Family Values Among the strongest supporters of Ronald Reagan's campaign for president were members of the religious right, including Christian groups like the Moral Majority, 61% of whom voted for him. By 1980, evangelical Christians had become an important political and social force in the United States. Some 1,300 radio stations in the country were owned and operated by evangelicals, Christian television programs, such as Pat Robertson's The 700 Club and Jim Backer's The PTL, Praise the Lord Club, proved enormously popular and raised millions of dollars from viewer contributions. For some, evangelism was a business, 
but most conservative Christians were true believers who were convinced that premarital and extramarital sex, abortion, drug use, homosexuality, and irreligious forms of popular and high culture were responsible for a perceived decline in traditional family values that threatened American society. Despite the support he received from Christian conservative and family values voters, Reagan was hardly an ideologue when it came to policy. Indeed, he was often quite careful in using hot-button, family value issues to his greatest political advantage. For example, as governor of California, one of the states that ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA in its first year, he positioned himself as a supporter of the amendment. When he launched his bid for the Republican nomination in 1976, however, he withdrew his support to gain the backing of more conservative members of his party. This move demonstrated both political savvy and foresight. At the time he withdrew his support, the Republican National Convention was still officially backing the amendment. However, in 1980, the party began to qualify its stance, which dovetailed with Reagan's candidacy for the White House. Reagan believed the 14th Amendment to the Constitution was sufficient protection for women against discrimination. Once in office, he took a mostly neutral position, neither supporting nor working against the ERA. Nor did this middle position appear to hurt him at the polls. He attracted a significant number of votes from women in 1980, and in 1984, he polled 56% of the women's vote compared to 44% for the Democratic ticket of Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro, the first female candidate for vice president from a major party. Reagan's political calculations notwithstanding, his belief that traditional values were threatened by a modern wave of immoral popular culture was genuine. He recognized that nostalgia was a powerful force in politics, and he drew a picture for his audiences of the traditional good old days under attack by immorality and decline. Those of us who are over 35 or so years of age grew up in a different America. He explained in his farewell address. We were taught very directly what it means to be an American. And we absorbed almost in the air a love of country and an appreciation of its institutions. If you didn't get these things from your family, you got them from the neighborhood, from the father down the street who fought in Korea, or the family who lost someone at Anzio. Or you could get a sense of patriotism from school. And if all else failed, you could get a sense of patriotism from the popular culture. The movies celebrated democratic values and implicitly reinforced the idea that America was special. But this America, he insisted, was being washed away. I'm warning of an eradication of that, of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Concern over a decline in the country's moral values welled up on both sides of the political aisle. In 1985, anxiety over the messages of the music industry led to the founding of the Parents Music Resource Center, PMRC, a bipartisan group formed by the wives of prominent Washington politicians, including Susan Baker, the wife of Reagan's Treasury Secretary, James Baker, and Tipper Gore, the wife of then-Senator Al Gore, a Democrat, who later became vice president under Bill Clinton. The goal of the PMRC was to limit the ability of children to listen to music with sexual or violent content. Its strategy was to get the recording industry to adopt a voluntary rating system for music and recordings, similar to the Motion Picture Association of America's system for movies. The organization also produced a list of particularly offensive recordings known as the Filthy 15. By August 1985, nearly 20 record companies had agreed to put labels on their recordings indicating explicit lyrics but the Senate began hearings on the issue in September. While many parents and a number of witnesses advocated the labels, many in the music industry rejected them as censorship. Twisted Sisters Dee Snyder and folk musician John Denver both advised Congress against the restrictions. In the end, 
the recording industry suggested a voluntary generic label. Its effect on children's exposure to raw language is uncertain, but musicians roundly mocked the effort. Defining American, Phyllis Schlafly and the Stop ERA Movement. In 1972, after a large number of states jumped to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, most observers believed its ultimate ratification by all the necessary states was all but certain. But a decade later, the amendment died without ever getting the necessary votes. There are many reasons it went down in defeat, but a major one was Phyllis Schlafly. On the surface, Schlafly's life might suggest that she would naturally support the ERA. After all, she was a well-educated professional woman who sought advancement in her field and even aspired to high political office. Yet she is a fascinating historical character, precisely because her life and goals don't conform to expected norms. Schlafly's attack on the ERA was unique in its method and effectiveness. Rather than attacking the amendment directly as a gateway to unrestrained and immoral behavior as some had, she couched her opposition in language that was sensitive to both privilege and class. Her instrument was the STOP ERA movement, with the acronym STOP, standing for Stop Taking Our Privileges. Schlafly argued that women enjoyed special privileges such as gender-specific restrooms and exemption from the military draft. These, she claimed, would be lost should the ERA be ratified. But she also claimed to stand up for the dignity of being a homemaker and lambasted the feminist movement as elitist. In this, she was keenly aware of the power of class interests. Her organization suggested that privileged women could afford to support the ERA. Working women and poor housewives, however, would ultimately bear the brunt of the loss of protection it would bring. In the end, her tactics were successful in achieving exactly what the movement's name suggested. She stopped the ERA. The AIDS Crisis In the early 1980s, doctors noticed a disturbing trend. Young gay men in large cities, especially San Francisco and New York, were being diagnosed with, and eventually dying from, a rare cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. Because the disease was seen almost exclusively in gay males, it was quickly dubbed gay cancer. Doctors soon realized it often coincided with other symptoms, including a rare form of pneumonia, and they renamed it Gay-Related Immune Deficiency, GRID. Although people other than gay men, primarily intravenous drug users, were dying from the disease as well. The connection between gay men and GRID, later renamed Autoimmune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, led straight people and mainstream news organizations to largely ignore the growing health crisis in the gay community. The federal government also overlooked the disease, and calls for more money to research and find the cure were ignored. Even after it became apparent that straight people could contract the disease through blood transfusions and sexual intercourse, HIV and AIDS continued to be associated primarily with the gay community, especially by political and religious conservatives. Indeed, the religious right regarded it as a form of divine retribution meant to punish gay men for their immoral lifestyle. President Reagan, always politically minded, was reluctant to speak openly about the developing crisis even as thousands faced certain death from the disease. He did not publicly mention the crisis until 1985 and did not deliver a major speech on the crisis until 1987. With little help coming from the government, the gay community quickly began to organize its own response. In 1982, New York City men formed the Gay Men's Health Crisis, GMHC, a volunteer organization that operated an information hotline, provided counseling and legal assistance, and raised money for people with HIV and AIDS. Larry Kramer, one of the original members, left in 1983 and formed his own organization, the AIDS Coalition, to unleash power, ACT Up, in 1987. ACT Up took a more militant approach, holding demonstrations on Wall Street outside the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and inside the New York Stock Exchange to call attention and shame the government into action. One of the images adopted by the group a pink triangle paired with the phrase 
silence equals death, captured media attention and quickly became the symbol of the AIDS crisis. Despite the growing scientific knowledge about HIV and AIDS, the epidemic led to widespread paranoia and misinformation. Gay and lesbian people faced widespread bigotry on the assumption that they could transmit the infection, and those who had contracted the IT through procedures such as blood transfusions were cast out as well. Ryan White, who contracted HIV through a transfusion and was diagnosed with AIDS at age 13, was barred from attending eighth grade after hundreds of parents and teachers signed petitions. Even after the Indiana Department of Education ruled that he must be readmitted, White was constantly threatened, bullied, and had a bullet shot through his house window. In a similar case, the three Ray brothers, who all contracted HIV through transfusions, were barred from their school and then removed from a second district after relocating. Their home was burned to the ground a week after a court ruled that they must be readmitted to school. By the mid-1980s, HIV and AIDS had reached crisis levels in the U.S. and beyond, but the turning point in public awareness and action was not the increasing number of people living with and dying from AIDS. Rather, a few people had an outsized effect. In 1985, Rock Hudson, one of the most prominent actors of the golden age of Hollywood, announced his AIDS diagnosis. He died later that year. Cultural icon Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of the rock group Queen, announced his HIV and AIDS diagnosis the day before he passed away. Groundbreaking tennis player Arthur Ashe, fashion designer Halston, and supermodel Gia Karangi also died from AIDS. Magic Johnson, one of the nation's best and most popular athletes, shocked the nation when he announced his HIV diagnosis. He immediately retired from basketball, but remained in the public eye and was among the most prominent people living with AIDS. In the ensuing years, HIV and AIDS remained a significant crisis, but public enmity toward those affected began to subside. The War on Drugs and the Road to Mass Incarceration As Ronald Reagan took office in 1981, violent crime in the United States was reaching an all-time high. While there were different reasons for the spike, the most important one was demographics. The primary category of offenders, males between the ages of 16 and 36, reached an all-time peak as the baby boomer generation came of age. But the phenomenon that most politicians honed in on as a cause for violent crime was the abuse of a new, cheap drug dealt illegally on city streets. Crack cocaine, a smokable type of cocaine popular with poorer addicts, was hitting the streets in the 1980s, frightening middle-class Americans. Reagan and other conservatives led a campaign to get tough on crime and promised the nation a war on drugs. Initiatives like the Just Say No campaign led by First Lady Nancy Reagan implied that drug addiction and drug-related crime reflected personal morality. Nixon had first used the term in 1971, but in the 1980s, the war on drugs took on an ominous dimension as politicians scrambled over each other to enact harsher sentences for drug offenses so they could market themselves as tough on crime. Penalties for crack possession and use far exceeded penalties for similar amounts of cocaine, a more expensive drug more commonly used by white people. State after state switched from variable to mandatory minimum sentences that were exceedingly long and particularly harsh for street drug crimes. The federal government supported the trend with federal sentencing guidelines, removal of judges' discretion, and additional funds for local law enforcement agencies. Practices like civil forfeiture, in which law enforcement or municipalities could seize and share cash and property of suspected criminals even before they were convicted, provided a significant incentive to investigate drug crimes. The additional funding sources and high likelihood of successful prosecution drove police forces toward more aggressive and inequitable tactics. Black and Hispanic people were many times more likely than white people 
to be pulled over for routine traffic stops and searches. Local police forces dedicated far more resources to patrolling minority-inhabited neighborhoods, resulting in far more arrests and prosecutions of Black and Hispanic people. This practice of racial profiling would become a civil liberties flashpoint, but the results were devastating to significant portions of the population. The law and order movement peaked in the 1990s when California introduced a three-strikes law that mandated life imprisonment without parole for any third felony conviction, even nonviolent ones. As a result, prisons became crowded and states went deep into debt to build more. By the end of the century, the war began to die down as the public lost interest in the problem. The costs of the punishment binge became politically burdensome, and scholars and politicians began to advocate the decriminalization of drug use. By this time, however, hundreds of thousands of people had been incarcerated for drug offenses, and the total number of prisoners in the nation had grown fourfold in the last quarter of the century. Particularly glaring were the racial inequities of the new age of mass incarceration, with African Americans being seven times more likely to be in prison. In some states, such as New York, over 90% of people in prison were black or Hispanic. Incarcerated people could neither generate income nor support their communities and families. In most states, convicted felons could not vote while in prison and even upon their release, which reduced the impact of minorities in legislation and representative bodies. And many companies and organizations avoided hiring people who had been previously convicted of felonies, resulting in a cycle of poverty and social stagnation that existed on stark racial lines. Greater awareness around police practices and use of force developed with the increased availability of recording devices. In 1991, the country watched a citizen's video of Los Angeles police officers repeatedly beating an unarmed man, Rodney King, with their batons. Over a minute of footage showed dozens of strikes and kicks while King lay on the ground or attempted to rise. The officers were put on trial for assault and excessive force, but were ultimately acquitted. In the riots that followed the acquittal, 63 people were killed and and over 2,000 injured with over $1 billion in damage. President Bush said that it was hard to understand how the verdict could square with the video. Two of the officers were later convicted of federal charges for willfully using unreasonable force. Thirty-one point three, political and cultural fusions. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the successes and failures of Ronald Reagan's foreign policy. Compare the policies of Ronald Reagan with those of George H. W. Bush. Explain the causes and results of the Persian Gulf War. Discuss the events that constituted the end of the Cold War. In addition to reviving the economy and reducing the size of the federal government. Ronald Reagan also wished to restore American stature in the world. He entered the White House a cold warrior and referred to the Soviet Union in a 1983 speech as an evil empire. Dedicated to upholding even authoritarian governments in foreign countries to keep them safe from Soviet influence, he was also desperate to put to rest Vietnam Syndrome, the reluctance to use military force in foreign countries for fear of embarrassing defeat, which had influenced U.S. foreign policy since the mid-1970s. The Middle East and Central America Reagan's desire to demonstrate U.S. readiness to use military force abroad sometimes had tragic consequences. In 1983, he sent soldiers to Lebanon as part of a multinational force trying to restore order following an Israeli invasion the year before. On October 23rd, more than 200 troops were killed in a barracks bombing in Beirut, carried out by Iranian-trained militants known as Hezbollah. In February 1984, Reagan announced that, given intensified fighting, U.S. troops were being withdrawn. Two days after the bombing in Beirut, Reagan and Secretary of State George P. Schultz authorized the invasion of Grenada, a small Caribbean island nation, 
in an attempt to oust a communist military junta that had overthrown a moderate regime. Communist Cuba already had troops and technical aid workers stationed on the island and were willing to defend the new regime. But the United States swiftly took command of the situation, and the Cuban soldiers surrendered after two days. Reagan's intervention in Grenada was intended to send a message to Marxists in Central America. Meanwhile, however, decades of political repression and economic corruption by certain Latin American governments, sometimes generously supported by U.S. foreign aid, had sown deep seeds of revolutionary discontent. In El Salvador, a 1979 civil military coup had put a military junta in power that was engaged in a civil war against left-leaning guerrillas when Reagan took office. His administration supported the right-wing government, which used death squads to silence dissent. Neighboring Nicaragua was also governed by a largely Marxist-inspired group, the Sandinistas. This organization, led by Daniel Ortega, had overthrown the brutal right-wing dictatorship of Anastasio Somoza in 1979. Reagan, however, overlooked the legitimate complaints of the Sandinistas and believed that their rule opened the region to Cuban and Soviet influence. A year into his presidency, convinced it was folly to allow the expansion of Soviet and communist influence in Latin America, he authorized the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, to equip and train a group of anti-Sandinista Nicaraguans known as the Contras, Contra Revolucionarios or Counter Revolutionaries, to oust Ortega. Reagan's desire to aid the Contras, even after Congress ended its support, led him, surprisingly, to Iran. In September 1980, Iraq had invaded neighboring Iran and, by 1982, had begun to gain the upper hand. The Iraqis needed weapons, and the Reagan administration, wishing to assist the enemy of its enemy, had agreed to provide Iraqi President Saddam Hussein with money, arms, and military intelligence. In 1983, however, the capture of Americans by Hezbollah forces in Lebanon changed the president's plans. In 1985, he authorized the sale of anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles to Iran in exchange for help retrieving three of the American hostages. A year later, Reagan's National Security Council aide, Lt. Col. Oliver North, found a way to sell weapons to Iran and secretly use the proceeds to support the Nicaraguan Contras in direct violation of a congressional ban on military aid to the anti-communist guerrillas in that Central American nation. Eventually, the Senate became aware, and North and others were indicted on various charges, which were all dismissed, overturned on appeal, or granted presidential pardon. Reagan, known for delegating much authority to subordinates and unable to remember crucial facts and meetings, escaped the scandal with nothing more than criticism for his lax oversight. The nation was divided over the extent to which the president could go to protect national interests and the limits of Congress's constitutional authority to oversee the activities of the executive branch have yet to be resolved. The Cold War waxes and wanes. While trying to shrink the federal budget and the size of government sphere at home, Reagan led an unprecedented military buildup in which money flowed to the Pentagon to pay for expensive new forms of weaponry. The press drew attention to the inefficiency of the nation's military industrial complex, offering as examples expense bills that included $640 toilet seats and $7,400 coffee machines. One of the most controversial aspects of Reagan's plan was the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, which he proposed in 1983. SDI, or Star Wars, called for the development of a defensive shield to protect the United States from a Soviet missile strike. Scientists argued that much of the needed technology had not yet been developed and might never be. Others contended that the plan would violate existing treaties with the Soviet Union and worried about the Soviet response. The system was never built, and the plan, estimated to have cost some $7.5 billion, was finally abandoned.
After his re-election in 1984, Reagan began to moderate his position toward the Soviets. Mikhail Gorbachev became the general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party and was willing to meet with the president. Reagan found he was able to work with the Soviet leader once Gorbachev distanced himself from the traditional communist policies. The new and comparatively young Soviet premier did not want to commit additional funds for another arms race, especially since the war in Afghanistan against Mujahideen, Islamic guerrilla fighters, had depleted the Soviet Union's resources severely since its invasion of the Central Asian nation in 1979. Gorbachev recognized that economic despair at home could easily result in larger political upheavals like those in neighboring Poland, where the Solidarity Movement had taken hold. He withdrew troops from Afghanistan, introduced political reforms and new civil liberties at home, known as Perestroika and Glasnost, and proposed arms reduction talks with the United States. In 1985, Gorbachev and Reagan met in Geneva to reduce armaments and shrink their respective military budgets. The following year, meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland, they surprised the world by announcing that they would try to eliminate nuclear weapons by 1996. In 1987, they agreed to eliminate a whole category of nuclear weapons when they signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, INF, Treaty at the White House. This laid the foundation for future agreements limiting nuclear weapons. African American Visibility and Leadership While desegregated education had been established by the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision, the government had few mechanisms to enforce desegregation until the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Only then could minorities and other underrepresented people begin to expect more equal treatment in employment and access to public resources. The outcomes were notable, but the challenges remained. The 1970 census, conducted only six years after the passing of the Civil Rights Act, found that only 38% of black men had a high school diploma, with only 13% attending college and 6% earning a bachelor's degree. By 1980, however, educational attainment had skyrocketed. 64% of black men achieved a high school diploma with 28% attending college. Historically, black women had a greater level of educational attainment than black men, and they benefited from the gains as well. Better education, coupled with protections against employment discrimination, began to offer black people more economic opportunities. Black writers, artists, actors, and other figures had a significant impact on 1980s culture and consciousness, coinciding with the frequency of their presence on mainstream television. In 1982, Bryant Gumbel became the first black anchor on network television. Soon after, the Miss America pageant crowned Vanessa Williams as its first black winner. Later in the decade, Oprah Winfrey began a talk show known for addressing socially charged and difficult topics while it skyrocketed to unparalleled viewership. And after an initial period of avoiding black artists, MTV would soon heavily feature R&B and hip-hop acts, leading to increased admiration and emulation among youth of all backgrounds. Alice Walker's The Color Purple received widespread critical acclaim becoming the first novel by a black woman to win the Pulitzer Prize. The novel depicts a woman who endures sexual, physical, and emotional abuse at the hands of her father and other men. After suffering loss and separation, she draws strength from other powerful women, and together they triumph over their trauma. The novel brought forth the stark realities facing women. It became a cultural touchstone and a staple of literature curricula. The Color Purple, and especially its movie adaptation, also sparked controversy among some prominent figures, including director Spike Lee and talk show host Tony Brown, who felt that the narrative painted a negative picture of black men. Increased visibility could not overcome the challenges facing black people in the 1980s. While the Reagan tax cuts offered financial gains for the wealthy, in 
The decade saw an alarming rise in economic inequality, the disparity between income among different groups. The nation's overall employment rose, but the manufacturing sector faced steady declines. Cities in Ohio, Michigan, western New York, Pennsylvania, and Indiana lost over half of their manufacturing jobs. Factory after factory closed, and companies from the automobile, steel, mining, and electronics industries began to shudder. The manufacturing belt, or factory belt, which ran through the Great Lakes region, became degraded by poverty and urban decay to the point that it was renamed the Rust Belt. The unemployment rate was almost twice as high for black people as it was for white people. Advocates seeking to address these disparities gained greater influence. The most prominent among these was Jesse Jackson, a widely known civil rights figure who had both a domestic and international impact. As the leader of the People United to Serve Humanity, PUSH, he'd led boycotts to drive more employment equality and had successfully negotiated the release of American hostages in Syria and Cuba. His 1984 run for president was the second national campaign by an African American after Shirley Chisholm's in 1972. Jackson's third place showing in the Democratic primaries was a better result than expected and gave him greater credibility leading up to his more successful candidacy in 1988. Jackson's 1988 campaign again centered on workers and refocusing America's priorities. He led a protest at a Wisconsin auto plant slated for closing, earning him the endorsement of the Regional Auto Workers Union. His platform included plans to eliminate the mandatory minimum sentences responsible for mass incarceration, as well as guarantees of universal health care and free community college. While considered exceedingly liberal, these positions earned him strong placement in the primary process, building on the support of a rainbow coalition of minorities and the working class as well as progressives. He would eventually finish second to the eventual nominee, Michael Dukakis, and spent the waning days of his campaign ensuring that African Americans' issues remained a priority within the party. While a lesser-known candidate, Lenora Filani achieved an important new milestone for black women with her own presidential campaign. As part of one of several minor parties in the election, Filani became the first woman and the first black person to gain presidential ballot access in all 50 states. She would get the most votes of any woman until Jill Stein in 2012. No new taxes. Confident they could win back the White House, Democrats mounted a campaign focused on more effective and competent government under the leadership of Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis. When George H.W. Bush, Reagan's vice president and Republican nominee, found himself down in the polls, political adviser Lee Atwater launched an aggressively negative media campaign, accusing Dukakis of being soft on crime and connecting his liberal policies to a brutal murder in Massachusetts. More importantly, Bush adopted a largely Reagan-esque style on matters of economic policy, promising to shrink government and keep taxes low. These tactics were successful, and the Republican Party retained the White House. Although he promised to carry on Reagan's economic legacy, the problems Bush inherited made it difficult to do so. Reagan's policies of cutting taxes and increasing defense spending had exploded the federal budget deficit, making it three times larger in 1989 than when Reagan took office in 1980. Bush was further constrained by the emphatic pledge he had made at the 1988 Republican convention, read my lips, no new taxes, and found himself in the difficult position of trying to balance the budget and reduce the deficit without breaking his promise. However, he also faced a Congress controlled by the Democrats who wanted to raise taxes on the rich, while Republicans thought the government should drastically cut domestic spending. In October, after a brief government shutdown when Bush vetoed the budget Congress delivered, he and Congress reached a compromise with the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990. The budget included measures to reduce the deficit 
by both cutting government expenditures and raising taxes, effectively reneging on the No New Taxes pledge. These economic constraints are one reason why Bush supported a limited domestic agenda of education reform and anti-drug efforts, relying on private volunteers and community organizations, which he referred to as a thousand points of light to address most social problems. When it came to foreign affairs, Bush's attitude towards the Soviet Union differed little from Reagan's. Bush sought to ease tensions with America's rival superpower and stressed the need for peace and cooperation. The desire to avoid angering the Soviets led him to adopt a hands-off approach when, at the beginning of his term, a series of pro-democracy demonstrations broke out across the communist Eastern Bloc. In November 1989, the world, including foreign policy experts and espionage agencies from both sides of the Iron Curtain, watched in surprise as peaceful protesters in East Germany marched through checkpoints at the Berlin Wall. Within hours, people from both East and West Berlin flooded the checkpoints and began tearing down large chunks of the wall. Months of earlier demonstrations in East Germany had called on the government to allow citizens to leave the country. These demonstrations were one manifestation of a larger movement sweeping across East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania, which swiftly led to revolutions, most of them peaceful, resulting in the collapse of communist governments in Central and Eastern Europe. In Budapest in 1956 and in Prague in 1968, the Soviet Union had restored order through a large show of force. That this didn't happen in 1989 was an indication to all that the Soviet Union was itself collapsing. Bush's refusal to gloat or declare victory helped him maintain the relationship with Gorbachev that Reagan had established. In July 1991, Gorbachev and Bush signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START, which committed their countries to reducing their nuclear arsenals by 25%. A month later, attempting to stop the changes begun by Gorbachev's reforms, Communist Party hardliners tried to remove him from power. Protests arose throughout the Soviet Union, and by December 1991, the nation had collapsed. In January 1992, 12 former Soviet republics formed the Commonwealth of Independent States to coordinate trade and security measures. The Cold War was over. American Global Power in the Wake of the Cold War The dust had barely settled on the crumbling Berlin Wall when the Bush administration announced a bold military intervention in Panama in December 1989. Claiming to act on behalf of human rights, U.S. troops deposed the unpopular dictator and drug smuggler Manuel Noriega swiftly, but former CIA connections between President Bush and Noriega as well as U.S. interests in maintaining control of the Canal Zone, prompted the United Nations and world public opinion to denounce the invasion as a power grab. As the Soviet Union was ceasing to be a threat, the Middle East became a source of increased concern. In the wake of its eight-year war with Iran, from 1980 to 1988, Iraq had accumulated a significant amount of foreign debt. At the same time, other Arab states had increased their oil production, forcing oil prices down and further hurting Iraq's economy. Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, approached these oil-producing states for assistance, particularly Saudi Arabia and neighboring Kuwait, which Iraq felt directly benefited from its war with Iran. When talks with these countries broke down and Iraq found itself politically and economically isolated, Hussein ordered the invasion of oil-rich Kuwait in August 1990. Bush faced his first full-scale international crisis. In response to the invasion, Bush and his foreign policy team forged an unprecedented international coalition of 34 countries, including many members of NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the Middle Eastern countries of Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Egypt, to oppose Iraqi aggression. Bush hoped that this coalition would herald the beginning of a new world order 
in which the nations of the world would work together to deter belligerence. A deadline was set for Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait by January 15th, or face serious consequences. Wary of not having sufficient domestic support for combat, Bush first deployed troops to the area to build up forces in the region and defend Saudi Arabia via Operation Desert Shield. On January 14th, Bush succeeded in getting resolutions from Congress authorizing the use of military force against Iraq, and the U.S. then orchestrated an effective air campaign, followed by Operation Desert Storm, a 100-hour land war involving over 500,000 U.S. troops and another 200,000 from 27 other countries, which expelled Iraqi forces from Kuwait by the end of February. Some controversy arose among Bush's advisors regarding whether to end the war without removing Saddam Hussein from power. But General Colin Powell, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, argued that to continue to attack a defeated army would be un-American. Bush agreed, and troops began moving out of the area in March 1991. Although Hussein was not removed from power, the war nevertheless suggested that the United States no longer suffered from Vietnam Syndrome and would deploy massive military resources if and when it thought necessary. In April 1991, United Nations UN Resolution 687 set the terms of the peace with long-term implications. Its concluding paragraph authorizing the UN to take such steps as necessary to maintain the peace was later taken as the legal justification for the further use of force, as in 1996 and 1998 when Iraq was again bombed. It was also referenced in the lead-up to the second invasion of Iraq in 2003 when it appeared that Iraq was refusing to comply with other UN resolutions. A Changing Domestic Landscape By nearly every measure, Operation Desert Storm was a resounding success. Through deft diplomatic efforts on the international stage, Bush had ensured that many around the world saw the action as legitimate. By making the goals of the military action both clear and limited, he also reassured an American public still skeptical of foreign entanglements. With the Soviet Union vanishing from the world stage and the United States demonstrating the extent of its diplomatic influence and military potency with President Bush at the helm, his re-election seemed all but inevitable. Indeed, in March 1991, the president had an approval rating of 89%. Despite Bush's successes internationally, the domestic situation at home was far more complicated. Unlike Reagan, Bush was not a natural culture warrior. Rather, he was a moderate, Connecticut-born Episcopalian, a pragmatic politician, and a lifelong civil servant. He was not adept at catering to post-Reagan conservatives as his predecessor had been. By the same token, he appeared incapable of capitalizing on his history of moderation and pragmatism regarding women's rights and access to abortion. Together with a Democratic Senate, Bush broke new ground in civil rights with his support of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a far-reaching law that prohibited discrimination based on disability in public accommodations and by employers. President Bush's weaknesses as a culture warrior were on full display during the controversy that erupted following his nomination of a new Supreme Court judge. In 1991, Justice Thurgood Marshall, the first African American ever to sit on the Supreme Court, opted to retire, thus opening a position on the court. Thinking he was doing the prudent thing by appealing to multiple interests, Bush nominated Clarence Thomas, another African-American, but also a strong social conservative. The decision to nominate Thomas, however, proved to be anything but prudent. During Thomas's confirmation hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Anita Hill, a lawyer who had worked for Thomas when he was chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, came forward with allegations that he had sexually harassed her when he was her supervisor. Thomas denied the accusations and referred to the televised hearings as a high-tech lynching. He survived the controversy 
and was appointed to the Supreme Court by a narrow Senate vote of 52 to 48. Hill, also African American, noted later in frustration, I had a gender, he had a race. In the aftermath, however, sexual harassment of women in the workplace gained public attention, and harassment complaints made to the EEOC increased 50% by the fall of 1992. The controversy also reflected poorly on President Bush and may have hurt him with female voters in 1992. Thirty one point four Bill Clinton and the New Economy. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain political partisanship, anti government movements, and economic developments during the Clinton administration, discuss President Clinton's foreign policy, explain how George W. Bush won the election of 2000. By 1992, many had come to doubt that President George H.W. Bush could solve America's problems. He had alienated conservative Republicans by breaking his pledge not to raise taxes, and some faulted him for failing to remove Saddam Hussein from power during Operation Desert Storm. Furthermore, despite living much of his adult life in Texas, he could not overcome the stereotypes associated with his privileged New England and Ivy League background, which hurt him among working-class Reagan Democrats. The Road to the White House the contrast between George A. W. Bush and William Jefferson Clinton could not have been greater. Bill Clinton was a baby boomer born in 1946 in Hope, Arkansas. His biological father died in a car wreck three months before he was born. When he was a boy, his mother married Roger Clinton, an alcoholic who abused his family. However, despite a troubled home life, Clinton was an excellent student. He took an interest in politics from an early age. On a high school trip to Washington, D.C., he met his political idol, President John F. Kennedy. As a student at Georgetown University, he supported both the civil rights and anti-war movements and ran for student council president. In 1968, Clinton received a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University. From Oxford, he moved on to Yale where he earned his law degree in 1973. He returned to Arkansas and became a professor at the University of Arkansas's law school. The following year, he tried his hand at state politics, running for Congress, and was narrowly defeated. In 1977, he became Attorney General of Arkansas and was elected governor in 1978. Losing the office to his Republican opponent in 1980, he retook the governor's mansion in 1982 and remained governor of Arkansas until 1992 when he announced his candidacy for president. During his campaign, Bill Clinton described himself as a new Democrat, a member of a faction of the Democratic Party that, like the Republicans, favored free trade and deregulation. He tried to appeal to the middle class by promising higher taxes on the rich and reform of the welfare system. Although Clinton garnered only 43% of the popular vote, he easily won in the Electoral College with 370 votes to President Bush's 188. Texas billionaire H. Ross Perot won 19% of the popular vote, the best showing by any third-party candidate since 1912 the Democrats took control of both houses of Congress. It's the economy, stupid. Clinton took office towards the end of a recession. His administration's plans for fixing the economy included limiting spending and cutting the budget to reduce the nation's $60 billion deficit, keeping interest rates low to encourage private investment and eliminating protectionist tariffs. Clinton also hoped to improve employment opportunities by allocating more money for education. In his first term, he expanded the Earned Income Tax Credit, which lowered the tax obligations of working families who were just above the poverty line. Addressing the budget deficit, the Democrats in Congress passed the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993 without a single Republican vote. 
The act raised taxes for the top 1.2% of the American people, lowered them for 15 million low-income families, and offered tax breaks to 90% of small businesses. Clinton also strongly supported ratification of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, a treaty that eliminated tariffs and trade restrictions among the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The treaty had been negotiated by the Bush administration, and the leaders of all three nations had signed it in December 1992. However, because of strong opposition from American labor unions and some in Congress who feared the loss of jobs to Mexico, the treaty had not been ratified by the time Clinton took office. To allay the concerns of unions, he added an agreement to protect workers and also one to protect the environment. Congress ratified NAFTA late in 1993. The result was the creation of the world's largest common market in terms of population, including some 425 million people. During Clinton's administration, the nation began to experience the longest period of economic expansion in its history, almost 10 consecutive years. Year after year, job growth increased and the deficit shrank. Increased tax revenue and budget cuts turned the annual national budget deficit from close to $290 billion in 1992 to a record budget surplus of over $230 billion in the year 2000. Reduced government borrowing freed up capital for private sector use, and lower interest rates in turn fueled more growth. During the Clinton years, more people owned homes than ever before in the country's history, 67.7%. Inflation dipped to 2.3%, and the unemployment rate declined, reaching a 30-year low of 3.9% in the year 2000. Much of the prosperity of the 1990s was related to technological change and the advent of new information systems. In 1994, the Clinton administration became the first to launch an official White House website and join the revolution of the electronically mediated world. By the 1990s, a new world of instantaneous global exposure was at the fingertips of billions worldwide. Americana, hope and anxiety in the information age. While the roots of innovations like personal computers and the internet go back to the 1960s and massive Department of Defense spending, it was in the 1980s and 90s that these technologies became part of everyday life. Like most technology-driven periods of transformation, the information age was greeted with a mixture of hope and anxiety upon its arrival. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, computer manufacturers like Apple, Commodore, and Tandy began offering fully assembled personal computers. Previously, personal computing had been accessible only to those adventurous enough to buy expensive kits that had to be assembled and programmed. In short order, computers became a fairly common sight in businesses and upper-middle-class homes. Soon, Computer owners, even young kids, were launching their own electronic bulletin board systems, small-scale networks that used modems and phone lines, and sharing information in ways not dreamed of just decades before. Computers, it seemed, held out the promise of a bright new future for those who knew how to use them. Casting shadows over the bright dreams of a better tomorrow were fears that the development of computer technology would create a dystopian future in which technology became the instrument of society's undoing. Film audiences watched a teenaged Matthew Broderick hacking into a government computer and starting a nuclear war in war games, Angelina Jolie being chased by a computer genius bent on world domination in hackers, and Sandra Bullock watching helplessly as her life is turned inside out by conspirators who manipulate her virtual identity in the net. Clearly, the idea of digital network connections as the root of our demise resonated in this period of rapid technological change. Domestic Issues in addition to shifting the Democratic Party to the moderate center on economic issues, Clinton tried to break new ground on a number of domestic issues and make good on traditional Democratic commitments to the disadvantaged minority groups and women. At the same time, he faced the challenge of domestic terrorism when a federal building in Oklahoma City was bombed, killing 168 people and injuring hundreds more. Healthcare Reform an important and popular part of Clinton's domestic agenda was health care reform that would make universal health care 
a reality. When the plan was announced in September of the president's first year in office, pollsters and commentators both assumed it would sail through. Many were unhappy with the way the system worked in the United States, where the cost of health insurance seemed increasingly unaffordable for the middle class. Clinton appointed his wife, Hillary Clinton, a Yale Law School graduate and accomplished attorney, to head his task force on national health care reform in 1993. The 1,342-page Health Security Act presented to Congress that year sought to offer universal coverage. All Americans were to be covered by a health care plan that could not reject them based on pre-existing medical conditions. Employers would be required to provide health care for their employees. Limits would be placed on the amount that people would have to pay for services. The poor would not have to pay at all. The outlook for the plan looked good in 1993. It had the support of a number of institutions like the American Medical Association and the Health Insurance Association of America. But in relatively short order, the political winds changed. As budget battles distracted the administration and the midterm elections of 1994 approached, Republicans began to recognize the strategic benefits of opposing reform. Soon, they were mounting fierce opposition to the bill. Moderate conservatives dubbed the reform proposals Hillary Care and argued that the bill was an unwarranted expansion of the powers of the federal government that would interfere with people's ability to choose the health care provider they wanted. Those further to the right argued that health care reform was part of a larger and nefarious plot to control the public. To rally Republican opposition to Clinton and the Democrats, Newt Gingrich and Richard Dick Armey, two of the leaders of the Republican minority in the House of Representatives, prepared a document entitled Contract with America, signed by all but two of the Republican representatives. It listed eight specific legislative reforms or initiatives the Republicans would enact if they gained a majority in Congress in the 1994 midterm elections. Lacking support on both sides, the health care bill was never passed and died in Congress. The reform effort finally ended in September 1994. Dislike of the proposed health care plan on the part of conservatives and the bold strategy laid out in the contract with America enabled the Republican Party to win seven Senate seats and 52 House seats in the November elections. The Republicans then used their power to push for conservative reforms. One such piece of legislation was the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, signed into law in August 1996. The act set time limits on welfare benefits and required most recipients to begin working within two years of receiving assistance. Don't ask, don't tell. Although Clinton had campaigned as an economically conservative New Democrat, he was thought to be socially liberal, and just days after his victory in the 1992 election, he promised to end the 50-year ban on gays and lesbians serving in the military. However, in January 1993, after taking the oath of office, Clinton amended his promise in order to appease conservatives. Instead of lifting the long-standing ban, the armed forces would adopt a policy of don't ask, don't tell. Those on active duty would not be asked their sexual orientation, and if they were gay, they were not to discuss their sexuality openly or they would be dismissed from military service. This compromise satisfied neither conservatives nor the LGBTQ community, which argued that LGBTQ people should be able to live without fear of retribution because of their sexuality. Clinton again proved himself willing to appease political conservatives when he signed into law the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, in September 1996, after both houses of Congress had passed it with such wide margins that a presidential veto could easily be overridden. DOMA defined marriage as a union between two people of the opposite sex and denied federal benefits to same-sex couples. It also allowed states to refuse to recognize same-sex marriages granted by other states. When Clinton signed the bill, he was personally opposed to same-sex marriage. Nevertheless, he disliked DOMA and later called for its repeal. In 
He also later changed his position on same-sex marriage. On other social issues, however, Clinton was more liberal. He appointed openly gay and lesbian men and women to important positions in government and denounced discrimination against people with AIDS. He supported the idea of the ERA and believed that women should receive pay equal to that of men doing the same work. He opposed the use of racial quotas in employment, but he declared affirmative action programs to be necessary. Seeking to wrest the tough-on-crime reputation from Republicans, Clinton and Democratic leaders developed the largest federal crime law to ever be enacted. While racially disparate, policing and incarceration was already well-established through efforts related to the war on drugs, the 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act added new penalties, funding, and incentives for aggressive law enforcement. The law helped states and communities expand police forces and build more prisons. Provisions to scale back parole also meant that people would remain incarcerated for longer periods of time regardless of behavior. The law also expanded the number of crimes punishable by death, enacted a sweeping assault weapons ban, and established the Violence Against Women Act. The 1994 law would have significant impacts on racial and ethnic minorities, continuing the pattern of inequitable mass incarceration and driving racially motivated policing. Based on its devastating impacts on black and Hispanic people, the law would later have significant political consequences for Democrats who supported it. As a result of his economic successes and his moderate social policies, Clinton defeated Senator Robert Dole in the 1996 presidential election. With 49% of the popular vote and 379 electoral votes, he became the first Democrat to win re-election to the presidency since Franklin Roosevelt. Clinton's victory was partly due to a significant gender gap between the parties, with women tending to favor Democratic candidates. In 1992, Clinton won 45 percent of women's votes compared to Bush's 38 percent, and in 1996, he received 54 percent of women's votes, while Dole won 38 percent. Domestic Terrorism the fears of those who saw government as little more than a necessary evil appeared to be confirmed in the spring of 1993, when federal and state law enforcement authorities laid siege to the compound of a religious sect called the Branch Davidians near Waco, Texas. The group, which believed the end of world was approaching, was suspected of weapons violations and resisted search and arrest warrants with deadly force. A standoff developed that lasted nearly two months and was captured on television each day. A final assault on the compound was made on April 19th, and 76 men, women, and children died in a fire probably set by members of the sect. Many others committed suicide or were killed by fellow sect members. During the siege, many anti-government and militia types came to satisfy their curiosity or show support for those inside. One was Timothy McVeigh, a former U.S. Army infantry soldier. McVeigh had served in Operation Desert Storm in Iraq, earning a Bronze Star, but he became disillusioned with the military and the government when he was deemed psychologically unfit for the Army Special Forces. He was convinced that the Branch Davidians were victims of government terrorism, and he and his co-conspirator Terry Nichols, determined to avenge them. Two years later, on the anniversary of the day that the Waco compound burned to the ground, McVeigh parked a rented truck full of explosives in front of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City and blew it up. More than 600 people were injured in the attack, and 168 died, including 19 children at the daycare center inside. McVeigh hoped that his actions would spark a revolution against government control. He and Nichols were both arrested and tried, and McVeigh was executed on June 11, 2001, for the worst act of terrorism committed on American soil. Just a few months later, the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, broke that dark record.
Clinton, and American hegemony. For decades, the contours of the Cold War had largely determined U.S. action abroad. Strategists saw each coup, revolution, and civil war as part of the larger struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. But with the Soviet Union vanquished, the United States was suddenly free of this paradigm, and President Clinton could see international crises in the Middle East, the Balkans, and Africa on their own terms, and deal with them accordingly. He envisioned a post-Cold War role in which the United States used its overwhelming military superiority and influence as global policing tools to preserve the peace. This foreign policy strategy had both success and failure. One notable success was a level of peace in the Middle East. In September 1993, at the White House, Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel and Yasser Arafat, Chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, signed the Oslo Accords, granting some self-rule to Palestinians living in the Israeli-occupied territories of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. A year later, the Clinton administration helped facilitate the second settlement and normalization of relations between Israel and Jordan. As a small measure of stability was brought to the Middle East, violence erupted in the Balkans. The communist country of Yugoslavia consisted of six provinces, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia, Montenegro, and Macedonia. Each was occupied by a number of ethnic groups, some of which shared a history of hostile relations. In May 1980, the leader of Yugoslavia, Josip Broz Tito, died. Without him to hold the country together, ethnic tensions increased, and this, along with the breakdown of communism elsewhere in Europe, led to the breakup of Yugoslavia. In 1991, Croatia, Slovenia, and Macedonia declared their independence. In 1992, Bosnia and Herzegovina did as well. Only Serbia and Montenegro remained united as the Serbian-dominated Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Almost immediately, ethnic tensions within Bosnia and Herzegovina escalated into war when Yugoslavian Serbs aided Bosnian Serbs who did not wish to live in an independent Bosnia and Herzegovina. These Bosnian Serbs proclaimed the existence of autonomous Serbian regions within the country and attacked Bosnian Muslims and Croats. During the conflict, the Serbs engaged in genocide, described by some as ethnic cleansing. The brutal conflict also gave rise to the systematic rape of enemy women, generally Muslim women exploited by Serbian military or paramilitary forces. The International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia estimated that between 12,000 and 50,000 women were raped during the war. NATO eventually intervened in 1995, and Clinton agreed to U.S. participation in airstrikes against Bosnian Serbs. That year, the Dayton Accords peace settlement was signed in Dayton, Ohio. Four years later, the United States, acting with other NATO members, launched an air campaign against Serbian-dominated Yugoslavia to stop it from attacking ethnic Albanians in Kosovo. Although these attacks were not sanctioned by the UN and were criticized by Russia and China, Yugoslavia withdrew its forces from Kosovo in June 1999. The use of force did not always bring positive results. For example, back in December 1992, George H.W. Bush had sent a contingent of U.S. soldiers to Somalia, initially to protect and distribute relief supplies to civilians as part of a U.N. mission. Without an effective Somali government, however, the warlords who controlled different regions often stole food, and their forces endangered the lives of U.N. workers. In 1993, the Clinton administration sent soldiers to capture one of the warlords, Mohammed Farah Aidid, in the city of Mogadishu. The resulting battle proved disastrous. A Black Hawk helicopter was shot down, and U.S. Army Rangers and members of Delta Force spent hours battling their way through the streets. Eighty-four soldiers were wounded, and 19 died.
the United States withdrew, leaving Somalia to struggle with its own anarchy. The sting of the Somalia failure probably contributed to Clinton's reluctance to send U.S. forces to end the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. In the days of brutal colonial rule, Belgian administrators had given control to Tutsi tribal chiefs, although Hutus constituted a majority of the population. Resentment over ethnic privileges and the discrimination that began then and continued after independence in 1962 erupted into civil war in 1990. The Hutu majority began to slaughter the Tutsi minority and their Hutu supporters. In 1998, while visiting Rwanda, Clinton apologized for having done nothing to save the lives of the 800,000 massacred in 100 days of genocidal slaughter. Impeachment Public attention was diverted from Clinton's foreign policing actions by a series of scandals that marked the last few years of his presidency. From the moment he entered national politics, his opponents had attempted to tie Clinton and his first lady to a number of loosely defined improprieties, even accusing him of murdering his childhood friend and deputy White House counsel, Vince Foster. One accusation the Clintons could not shake was of possible improper involvement in a failed real estate venture associated with the Whitewater Development Corporation in Arkansas in the 1970s and 1980s. Kenneth Starr, a former federal appeals court judge, was appointed to investigate the matter in August 1994. While Starr was never able to prove any wrongdoing, he soon turned up other allegations, and his investigative authority was expanded. In May 1994, Paula Jones, a former Arkansas state employee, filed a sexual harassment lawsuit against Bill Clinton. Starr's office began to investigate this case as well. When a federal court dismissed Jones's suit in 1998, her lawyers promptly appealed the decision and submitted a list of other alleged victims of Clinton's harassment. That list included the name of Monica Lewinsky, a young White House intern. Both Lewinsky and Clinton denied under oath that they had had a sexual relationship. The evidence, however, indicated otherwise, and Starr began to investigate the possibility that Clinton had committed perjury. Again, Clinton denied any relationship and even went on national television to assure the American people that he had never had sexual relations with Lewinsky. However, after receiving a promise of immunity, Lewinsky turned over to Starr evidence of her affair with Clinton, and the president admitted he had indeed had inappropriate relations with her. He nevertheless denied that he had lied under oath. In September, Starr reported to the House of Representatives that he believed Clinton had committed perjury. Voting along partisan lines, the Republican-dominated House of Representatives sent articles of impeachment to the Senate, charging Clinton with lying under oath and obstructing justice. In February 1998, the Senate voted 45 to 55 on the perjury charge and 50-50 on obstruction of justice. Although acquitted, Clinton did become the first president to be found in contempt of court. Nevertheless, although he lost his law license, he remained a popular president and left office at the end of his second term with an approval rating of 66%, the highest of any U.S. president. The Election of 2000 Despite Clinton's high approval rating, his vice president and the 2000 Democratic nominee for president, Al Gore, was eager to distance himself from scandal. Unfortunately, he also alienated Clinton loyalists and lost some of the benefit of Clinton's genuine popularity. Gore's desire to emphasize his concern for morality led him to select Connecticut Senator Joseph Westman Lieberman as his running mate. Lieberman had been quick to denounce Clinton's relationship with Monica Lewinsky. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader ran as the candidate of the Green Party, a party devoted to environmental issues and grassroots activism, and Democrats feared that he would attract votes that Gore might otherwise win. On the Republican side, where strategists promised to restore honor and dignity to the White House, 
voters were divided between George W. Bush, governor of Texas and eldest son of former President Bush, and John McCain, an Arizona senator and Vietnam War veteran. Bush had the robust support of both the Christian right and the Republican leadership. His campaign amassed large donations that it used to defeat McCain, himself an outspoken critic of the influence of money in politics. The nomination secured, Bush selected Dick Cheney, part of the Nixon and Ford administrations, and Secretary of Defense under George H.W. Bush as his running mate. 100 million votes were cast in the 2000 election, and Gore topped Bush in the popular vote by 540,000 ballots, or 0.5%. The race was so close that news reports declared each candidate the winner at various times during the evening. It all came down to Florida, where early returns called the election in Bush's favor by a mere 527 of 5,825,000 votes. Whoever won Florida would get the state's 25 electoral votes and secure the presidency. Because there seemed to be irregularities in four counties traditionally dominated by Democrats, especially in largely African-American precincts, Gore called for a recount of the ballots by hand. Florida's Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, set a deadline for the new vote tallies to be submitted, a deadline the counties could not meet. When the Democrats requested an extension, the Florida Supreme Court granted it. But Harris refused to accept the new tallies unless the counties could explain why they had not met the original deadline. When the explanations were submitted, they were rejected. Gore then asked the Florida Supreme Court for an injunction that would prevent Harris from declaring a winner until the recount was finished. On November 26, Harris declared Bush the winner in Florida. Gore protested that not all votes had been recounted by hand. When the Florida Supreme Court ordered the recount to continue, the Republicans appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which decided five to four to stop the recount. Bush received Florida's electoral votes, and with a total of 271 votes in the Electoral College to Gore's 266, became the 43rd President of the United States. This has been U.S. History from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by CC Echo, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions, Open Education Resources. You can learn more about CC Echo by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can even download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.